Welcome to the uh, weekly webcast. This week, we we'll learned a portion of Vayigash. It's the week of Vayigash. And the story of Vayigash is it brings to conclusion the events and everything related to the sale of Joseph. As you will remember, in the week portion two weeks ago, we read that they first sold him and that he ended up in Egypt in prison. In the last week's portion, he was taken out of prison and he became the viceroy of Egypt and he began to, he became the provider of sustenance for the entire world, civilized world at the time. And that's when his brothers came and they didn't recognize him and this, the whole story happened that he uh, they, they brought back there his brother Benjamin with them and he, the story with the goblet that he, they found the goblet in his he was accused of theft and they were going to take him as a slave and then this, so this week the Torah opens up with the Yehuda the great Yehuda standing up and going over to Joseph and battling out with him this issue he tells him, you, you, you know, you, you need to give me back my brother and I have to take him back to his father or he has to go back to his father and if you want, I will remain as a slave instead of him. Punish me, this is not him. And I can, cannot, you know, he's, he's so attached to his father and it would be a disaster. It would be a disaster if he would... Uh, remain of his father wouldn't be able to tell to handle it and when Yehuda made such a passionate plea with Joseph Joseph broke and he finally disclosed his true identity and that he's Joseph and and that they have nothing to worry about he has no grudge because he believes that it was all this was all part of God's master plan to have him brought down to Egypt to become the provider of the world and that brings all the Jews down to Egypt eventually for the exodus for the giving of the Torah and history starts to unfold over here but what I want to address today is <coughs> the big question is now it's all over the story comes to a happy ending but what was this all about how could the brothers have really done such a thing? Sell their brother. You kidnap him. You sell him. They almost killed him. They wanted to kill him first. It was only Judah's plea. No, not Judah. Reuben's plea not to kill him, but to put him in a pit. And then later Judah's plea. To not sell, put, leave him in the pit, but to sell him as a slave. And this way he's, we don't kill him at least. And they'll make up a story told their father that he was kidnapped by he was devoured by a by a uh, wild beast and so what were they thinking how could ten tzaddikim righteous men behave this way now there's two ways of there's two approaches one approach could be because they're they're not such tzaddikim they're terrible people and they had the sibling rivalry in the worst degree, the worst case of sibling rivalry. And it got to the point where they even were willing to kill him. And that's who they are. That's one approach. The problem with that approach is when you read any elementary level of reading of the brothers of Joseph, the tribes, you get the picture that these are not regular people. These are really holy people. From them come the whole Jewish people. And even if you're going to say that they're not the holiest, but they're certainly not murderers and uh, kidnappers. It, it, it just doesn't fit the, fit the profile. And indeed they are from the holiest, Sadiq. Their names are engraved on the, 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 the breastplate of the high priest later on when the, the temple is built. I mean, these are the men. These, they, they are the... the, the the originators of the Jewish people, they're tzaddikim. It says it clear. So how could they do this? And then the other hand, the other hand, Joseph's behavior in the beginning, it's, you know, telling them, I'm going to be the king and you're going to bow to me, foreseeing all of this. What was he thinking? 
Well, how is that becoming of him? So therefore, let me share with you tonight how Hasidus understands this story and it will shed some light on the whole picture. Joseph and his brothers are in a perpetual battle of ideas. It's a battle of ideas. The two ideas go like this. What's rephrase that? The battle between Joseph and his brothers, what is the ideal Jew? What is the purpose and function of the Jewish people? Which we are beginning now. You will know, if you remember from the past, we learned that the brothers of Joseph were shepherds. That's what their job was. They shepherded flock. That was their occupation. Why they take up such an occupation? Well, you could say it runs the family business. I mean, his father, their father was a shepherd and the grandfather, you know. But there's a reason why the father was also. Why was he a shepherd? The reason is because... And, and what was Joseph's job? Joseph was never a shepherd. Joseph, from the earliest days, from a teenager, he's dreaming about big things. He's dreaming about being king. He's dreaming about his brothers bowing to him, which means he's dreaming about him being the king and the ruler one day. So you have over here, on the one hand, these, this, these ten are shepherds, and this man is thinking about a throne, a kingdom, a, a monarchy. He's thinking big. What's really going on here? And the difference is, the reason they took up the, the, the profession of a shepherd is because you've got to make a living, obviously, but you can make a living and you can make a living. You can make a living by becoming involved in commerce and business and the world and taking on the world. And then you can look for a way to make money and sustain yourself by simple, by being a little bit removed from the world, like being a shepherd. What is the occupation of a shepherd? They take, they, they, they lead their flock into the nature. They graze. The shepherd's able to, you know, they have this, the, uh, the, the paintings of shepherds, they have them playing a violin or a flute. They're in a little bit of a different world. They're like in, you know, in a, they're, they're a little bit aloof. It's a good way to make a living if you want to be aloof. You get your, the, the flock go and you can do it. You can meditate and sing. And like, like the King David, you know, he was a shepherd of, of sheep and he sang and he wrote psalms and he was, he was like in a different world. He was removed. That's the truth. It's like Woodstock. Not Woodstock. It's the opposite of Woodstock. Woodstock was the opposite of that. <laughs> but they went, so they developed the opinion. Their view of Judaism was that the Jewish people are the, going to become the chosen people, that I have to carry the torch of godliness in the world. They're the holy people. And as holy people, they have to be holy and removed. It's similar to the story of the spies, <clears throat> if you want to make a parallel. They believe that the Jewish people's function is to be holy, and therefore, sh even if you do have to live in this world and make a living, you have to look for a holy occupation that allows you to be holy as much as possible, be a shepherd, and completely removed. Disassociate yourself from worldly matters, completely remove yourself and have nothing to do with physical, materialistic things as much as possible. And Yosef began talking a different language. This, they, they, this, they were for many years shepherds, that's what they believed, that it worked well for them. And they, this was a vision for the future of the Jewish people, what Judaism is meant to be. Joseph comes along and starts talking a language of dreams about kingdom and royalty and, and becoming the provider of the whole world. Everyone's going to bow to him and he's going to stand on top of the world. And you wonder, how did this kid come from this family? He has a whole different, you know, outlook on life. 
What is the outlook of Yosef? Yosef's outlook is, on the contrary, the Jewish people have to engage and become the leaders of the world, not to become the kings of the world necessarily, but to be very much engaged in what goes on in this world. Influence. Get in. Get involved. Make a difference in the world. Be on top. And from there, teach and inspire and be a light unto the nations as you become engaged with the nations. Provide them with sustenance and that way you can provide them with spiritual sustenance as well. And indeed he did that. When you look at the story, it's in this week and last week. It says that Joseph had all the people that came to him circumcised. Whoever wanted food, he would give them food if they were circumcised. We learned that in Rashi. Why do you have them circumcised? To elevate them. This is before the real, you know, all the Jew, this, before the Torah is given. So he extended the idea of circumcision, which is purifies the person, elevates the person, extended it to all mankind. He created, he caused an elevation within society. So his idea was, you cannot uh, inspire from a distance. You cannot inspire from a distance. You have to inspire from him by engaging. The brothers, on the other hand, felt that this is, spells danger for the Jewish people. They saw Joseph as a danger to the whole Jewish people. Because they did not believe that this Judaism could survive under those circumstances. So for the sake of Judaism, they felt that he has to be removed. Because of his opinions, as if his outlook takes hold in the family, and in the future family of the Jewish people, the holiness of the Jewish people will be terribly compromised and maybe disappear completely. So they set out to kill him. To remove this idea and the person that believed in such an idea from bringing a threat to the Jewish, entire Jewish program. At the end they sold him. So at least they felt that he was no longer a danger to the society of the Jewish people that have to remain in a holy, living holy in an elevated state, in a godly state, what have you. But what, the, what at the end of the story, what happens? The Jewish people end up, he ends up going to Egypt, becoming the viceroy, of course, and the brothers following him and bowing to him. What's the bow? Admission. Because you can say they bowed to him only before they knew who he really was. No, they bowed to him even afterwards. They don't actually physically bow. It's not recorded that they bow after him, but they certainly acquiesced and recognized that he was right. So that's the first thing. And Yosef, of course, ends up being the one that was right about all this. The second important story here is and lesson. So what's the lesson of this? Lesson is very simple, that indeed, there's no question that both methods were right. The brothers are remain right, and Joseph remains right. But the majority of our Jews' life is the life of Joseph. The minority of a Jew's life is the life of the brothers. And what I mean by that is, let's take the daily life of a Jew. And your day has to be split 10% the brothers and 90% Joseph, or whatever, 80, 20. You have to have those hours of, of, of seclusion, those hours, hours of remove, being removed from the world to tap into your soul and to nurture your soul and to make your soul and sustain your soul, make it connected to God by davening and learning and so on, where it is removed, where it is entirely spiritual, 
but then the rest of the day, the job of a Jew is to engage and to be involved in the world. Not to remove yourself. To be to influence from inside, not from a distance. But in order to influence from inside, you need to be removed a little bit. So that's why we have the hours of day, the day that we dedicate to, to Hashem through davening and learning are those ten brothers moment. That, their idea. Whereas the majority of the day is we're acting like Joseph. And that's how life is. Our beginning of our life begins with 10, 20 years of study, of learning, davening, training yourself in the spiritual world, in the spiritual realm. And then you marry and you engage the world and you become involved in other things and engaging the world from a closeness, not from a distance. And that's our life is reflected in microcosm in, the day, in, a day, in our day. Two hours in the morning or an hour in the morning in seclusion and davening and learning removed and then engagement. Now there's another interesting point in this story. The story continues that finally he hugs and kisses his brothers and they kiss him and there's a wonderful reunion and Binyamin they fall on each other it says Yosef falls on Binyamin's neck and he cried and they embraced each other this one fell on his and he fell on him and they both cried so it's interesting the verse tells us Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. So what's interesting over here is that each, they each cried on the other's neck. So Rashi points out something very, very interesting. Why did they cry on each other's neck? Why are they crying? So you could say simply that they're crying because they haven't seen each other for so long. You know, it's like an emotional get-together, but there's more to it. Rashi says that they fell upon each other's neck and wept over the two temples. There was one temple that was going to be built eventually in Benjamin's in Benjamin's uh, plot of land, in Benjamin's section of the land of Israel. That was the two temples of, in Jerusalem, because that's where it's built. And then there was the temple that was built in Joseph's section of Israel, in the Shiloh, be, that was built before that they, they took over Jerusalem and built the temple in Jerusalem. It's, it stood there for 369 years, the oh. temple. So each other, they, they cried over the temple that was destined to be built and destroyed. So they're crying over the destruction of each other's temple. So Yosef is crying over the destruction of Binyamin's temple, his temples, both of them, and jo Binyamin, on the other hand, is crying on the shoulder of Yosef over the destruction of Yosef's temple. So they're each crying over each other's temple. So the question is, why don't they cry over their own temple? It doesn't make any sense. If you're going to cry, you should be crying over your own temple. No? Why on someone else's? I mean, cry on both. Cry on all three. Both cry on all, on, on, each, on everyone's temple. Why are you crying on his and he's crying on his? What's the meaning of this? And the answer is, and here too there's a great, wonderful lesson, that when you cry, you should only cry in someone else's problems, not on your own. Huh? On your own problems you shouldn't cry, you should get busy and do something about them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sitting and crying over your own problems no. is not going to solve them. No. Someone else's problems you may not be able to solve, so yeah, at least you cry. What more could you do? You can cry. You can cry with them and cry over them, cry for them and feel bad for them. But on your own problems to cry, you're wasting your time. That's wasted energy. You've got to do something. But your own problems, you don't cry, you do something about it. So Yosef cries over Benjamin's temple. Now because his own temple, he has nothing to cry about. He's got to do something. <coughs> Daven more, learn more, do something positive to save this, to, 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 to thwart the eventual destruction, if you will. Over someone else's, you have nothing you can do. You cry. <coughs> you empathize with someone else. Sympathize with someone else. Cry with someone else. 
you go to a yeshiva house, you cry with them. What can, what can you do? If someone else has lost his business, you cry with them. The person that lost the business shouldn't cry. You should go get, in the, you should go get busy, get a different job. There's nothing to cry about. You have to go do something. That's wasted. But you can't get him a job. I can't get you a job. And he can't get her a job. The only thing he can do about her loss is cry. About his own loss and your own loss, you've got to do something. And that's a very important lesson. A lot of times we wallow in our problems. Mm. You're blaming yourself and blaming everyone else and God and the angels and this one and that one. And you get caught up and you go on for years like this, blaming everyone or blaming yourself and you're crying and you're depressed and, and you're going and getting nowhere. You cry for someone else's problems, not your own. Your own problems you do something about. Them. So therefore, <coughs> and this, I'll, I'll share with you a third important aspect of this whole story. And that is Yosef's attitude towards his brothers following in this whole event, in this whole story. He holds no grudge. And he tells them that I hold no grudge. And he's not, he's not being dishonest about it. He's honest about it. He's honest. He means it. He, taka holds, he really holds no grudge. How could it be he just holds no grudge? He explains to them because he realized that their fact that they ended up in Egypt I'm sorry that he ended up in Egypt and this whole event, this whole story is because this was part of God's master plan that he should end up in Egypt and he should get there and be the provider of sustenance for the whole world and, and get the Jewish people down to Egypt so that they can start the Jewish story he says, my beef is not with you, he says. You're just the people that, the channels through which this happened. If you guys made a bad choice, that's between you and God. You have to do tshuva, then they did. You have to repent. But that's not my problem. I needed to be in Egypt, so it was either you were going to get me here or someone else was going to get me here. So I'm not going to be angry at you for ending up in Egypt. I had to be in Egypt. Yeah. The only one that I... The, 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 the only issue that's left is they have to repent for their negative, bad choice that they made to sell them. They mm -hmm. didn't have to do that. God wants to get Joseph down to Egypt. Let God find other ways yeah. to do it. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be you don't have to be involved in that. So that's... They have to take that up. God has to take that up with them and they have to take that up with God. But Joseph has nothing to do with this. As far as he's concerned, I needed to be here, so I don't care how I got here. Hmm. You guys were the culprit. You, made a, you, you, you got involved. That You shouldn't have, but that's your problem, not mine. Because I was going to be here anyway. And that is one of the most um, fundamental, really fundamental uh, beliefs of a Jew and any person. When we talk about divine providence, yeah? Mm. It really relates to the idea of divine providence. What is divine providence? Divine providence is that God runs the world and every detail in it. So just to, to uh, make this a little more relevant to us, we don't get sold and we don't get to become kings and we don't, none of that happens to us. But what does happen is someone breaks your window, flattens your tire, and now you have to buy a new tire, you spent a hundred dollars. Right? Okay, so the law is that the person that did it has to pay you back damages. He has to pay you back. So let's not take an example of, of uh, mo monetary money. Take an example of someone uh, caused you uh, a damage that you cannot reclaim from him. <coughs> Some kind of a damage. <coughs> of 
caused you to miss your... Oh, let's take an example. A person caused you to miss your plane. He's clearly at fault. He held you back. Didn't let you get into your car. Got into a fight with you, held you back, and as a result, you missed your plane. You missed uh, an important event in the destination you were flying to. You missed your child's uh, graduation. Right? So this is not a monetary thing. He can pay back damages. There's no damages, no monetary damages. It's just a, a terrible thing that happened. He caused you not to be at your child's ceremony. Now, you have one of two choices. You can say, you are such a terrible person, I'm going to pay you back for this, and I'm going to hate you for the rest of your life. Hmm. What did you do? I don't have the picture of my child. wasn't there to see her with her cap and gown. I, which is really a terrible thing to miss. But if you think about it, if you believe in God, you really have, you have no issue with that person. Your issue is really with God. It's obvious that God did not want you to be at that thing. So you have to really figure out why is it that God wanted me to be there. If it wouldn't be this person, I'd probably, the plane would be delayed. Something would happen. You wouldn't be there. There's no question you wouldn't be there. Mm. The fact that he made a bad choice to hold you back and cause the, and be the, the, the culprit, that's between him and God. That has nothing to do with you. That's not your, you have no issue with him. Because no matter what, you wouldn't have been there. So don't be angry that he made you miss the thing. What made you miss the, the graduation was God. He should not have done it. He has to be punished. With a full, that simple justice. But as far as you and him, there's really nothing in between you. There is no issue between you and him. It's like, you know, to give you an example, someone took a very expensive piece of crystal and took it up on the top of a roof and threw it down. And before it hit the floor, someone else took a bat and broke it. So who do you have a problem with? Right. <laughs> who are you upset at now? The guy that threw it from the roof or the guy that hit it? Yeah. The person that hit it is a material. Is, is, it was a broken and he broke a broken thing. It was going to break anyway. It was going to land on the concrete. It was, you have no, that, that person is not your problem. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. It's gonna, it was going to happen anyway. So why are you angry? I think you should be angry at the guy that threw it off the roof. That's the real person that broke your thing. But if you're only you know, you're just seeing it like tunnel vision, you see this guy broke my thing. But he broke a broken thing. He didn't bring anything. He didn't break anything that was whole. It was whole in two seconds. It would have been and, uh, broken anyway. And according to Jewish law, he's not even liable. The second guy is not liable to pay damages. The first guy that's really, the guy that threw it off the roof is well liable to pay damages. Mm -hmm. second guy just got to have some fun the you know, second guy didn't really break anything that wasn't broken already so it's the same thing over here you missed your uh, you missed your flight God threw it off the roof this guy came in the middle and banged it in so he shouldn't have done it there's no question about it but the missing of that flight and that graduation was inevitable see if we get focused on the person that hit the broken piece already. The, the almost broken piece. And that's in life. We get caught up with that all the time. We don't realize that if it happened, it was meant to happen. Not through this person, obviously. Uh -huh. But it was going to happen. So if you're worried about this, your crystal, your issue is not with him. That was going to break. It's not meant to be. It's not meant to be. And not because of him. He was just the middleman that, that caused it to manifest itself that way. This is not an easy thing, by the way. It's not easy. And it doesn't mean that people shouldn't be punished for their wrong choices either. They absolutely should be punished for their wrong choices. And that's the way it is. If you believe in God for real... And that's a challenge. That's why the Al-Tarebbe says in Tanya that belief, believing 
in something is called emuna. Believing in God is called emuna. The word emuna also shares a similar root with the word omen, which means a profession. It's a talent, or a more a it's a craftsmanship. It's it takes training. Omen means to train someone. To believe in God, you have to train yourself. It depends how you want to believe. If you just believe that oh, there's a creator, there's some kind of God out there. That's easy. But if you believe that God is running the world, divine providence, the way it really is, that takes training. Because that takes really refocusing. Mm -hmm. To see every event for what it truly is. Like Yosef did. This we learn from Joseph. Joseph really had his, he was focused on God. And I want you to know something. It is from Joseph that we get the ultimate training of how to believe in God. Why is that? There I go back to my first point. Joseph was of the opinion that you have to engage in the world. The, gay, the world is got part of God's world, plan. The world is God's. So how do you really come to believe in God for real? When you're in the world and you see how the dots are being connected. Only when you're in the world do you really see what divine providence is. So it turns out that the brothers' idea of keeping us away from the world would have made a mediocre Jew. Yes, he would be spiritual. I don't know if he'd be holy. <clears throat> he'd be very spiritual, but I don't know how much holiness he would have in his life. Yosef taught us, in, be in the world... Go out into Mitzrayim, and over there you'll discover God. For real. You'll see divine providence. But that takes training. Only Joseph could have come to this conclusion. That my ending up in, Jew in, in Egypt is master plan. When you live on a rooftop, or on a mountaintop, flocking, you know, shepherding flock... You hardly see the world. You don't even know what divine providence really is. You don't see it. So it's Joseph's ideals that bring us to the third point. That, you, that belief in God is really a training. It's to refocus yourself in the world. And if we can do that, that is of course what we need to do. But it didn't take much because he realized right away why he had to be in Egypt. He didn't realize it right away. Well, it took, took 13, 13 years, years. 14 years, let's say. But I'm saying... <laughs> he well, suffered for good for 14 know, but, long but years. But the thing is, is that after... Four, I mean, now some people never know. I mean, you That's know what I'm That's true. Saying? That's my so point. So at least he it came full circle, if you right, will. Right, sure. It absolutely did. He realized, you know, if it wasn't for this, we'd all be, we'd all be hungry and there'd be famine and we'd die. That's exactly his point. So he has no beef with them. Right. But you're saying... I hear what you're saying. You're saying that not everyone... Sees the ultimate the, result. Right, exactly. When I miss my flight, yeah. I don't know this, oh, see why I had to miss right, my flight. Right, right. You're right. All, right. I, all I know is I didn't see my daughter's uh, graduation. Right. How that is a good thing, we don't see it. Joseph right. saw it. That's right. true. You're right. Sometimes in life we do see right away how it's feeling. turns it's out good. meant to be. Sometimes we don't. But yeah, like when, when the, don't see when the it, temple caught fire that time. Right. But, you know, at first it was, oh my goodness, right. and now we know why. Right. That was a good it thing. Led to something better. It's true. Right. As your wife told you. So mm -hmm. this is the story of Joseph and his brother. It's a battle of ideas mm -hmm. that comes full circle with the brothers admitting that Joseph is right. But you know what they do at the end? They establish a yeshiva in, in Goshen. Mm -hmm. They establish a yeshiva. Is that the first yeshiva? Yeah. No, it's not the first issue. What was the first issue? Shame and Aver. J Jacob learned in this his oh. issue. But they establish a yeshiva in Goshen. And there J Jacob is telling Joseph, you are right, but your brothers are also right. Mm -hmm. You need a yeshiva. Huh. You need a spiritual haven for the Jewish people. You can't just rely on them being on the throne <coughs> and being able to be Joseph's. Not, not the, Joseph to be Joseph. The regular Tom, Dick, and Harry needs a yeshiva. 15 years before he goes to become a Joseph. So there you have Jacob telling Joseph, you're right, we're coming down to your Egypt, but we're setting up a yeshiva. Huh. The brothers have a point. They're not completely wrong. 
So Yaakov makes peace ultimately between Joseph and the brothers by establishing a yeshiva in Egypt. Thank you. We will see you again next week.